Good morning and Merry Christmas. Welcome to worship today. I want to especially welcome any guests or visitors. My name is Lynn Forge, and I want to uh, make sure that uh, you know that today is a special day in the life of the church, and it's extra special because you're here worshiping and celebrating the birth of the Christ child with us this morning. Now it's time for us to find the red registration booklet. It's found in the seat rack in front of you, all the way down the left side of the aisle. Please sign your name and pass that along to your worshiping neighbors to your right this morning. Well, it's been an exciting few days in the life of the church, and today is no exception. We are excited to, he uh, to hear the final part of our December sermon series called Gaining Weight. And uh, we are um, also going to be privileged to hear Pastor Brian as he delivers his wonderful message titled Waiting for the Next Big Thing. Wonderful and uh, somewhat surprising message this morning. Now it's time for us to rise as a people of Christ, shake the hands of those folks around you, and welcome everyone that you, you see and wish them a Merry Christmas this morning. Joy and so 
are the B team. Which means that when you get to heaven, um, the um, only people who will be ahead of you in all of the great perks of heaven will be those who came to the 9.30 service today. <laughs> but the B team is not bad, because consider all the others who are sleeping in or opening up gifts right now. We have no idea where they're going. But, uh, <laughs> but you are very special. Thank you for joining us in worship on this Christmas day. Um, a couple of announcements by way of life and ministry. Uh, I want to make sure that you know about our worship theme for the month of January, because I consider this to be a, a deeply important theme for us to rally around. It's entitled Walk Clean, and it, it, it's going to give us the opportunity to reflect upon God's gift to us in the sacrament of holy baptism. We're going to discuss some um, and discover what it means to be baptized children of God, what happens in baptism, and how do we live out you know, this life of, of faith as discipled and baptized people. As a special um, event on January 8th, which is Baptism of Jesus Sunday, um, we're hoping to have baptisms at all three of our worship services. So if you have not been baptized, or if you have a family member who's not been baptized, or if you know of somebody who's not been baptized, um, call the church office and we will do everything we can to arrange for baptisms of those individuals on January 8th, and uh, it will be a great celebration. Uh, members of the congregation, this announcement is only for you, so if you're a guest or visitor today, you can, if you haven't already tuned out of what I'm saying, um, but members, make sure that you have your pledge card um, sent into the church office. If you happen to have lost your pledge card, you can pick, a, we'll pick one up from the usher after the worship service today. Um, and Or if you'd like to get online, you can get onto our website and do an online pledge. But uh, your pledge cards are really important. We believe them to be uh, essential, actually, uh, to allow us to live disciplined, giving lives in the year to come. So please fill out your pledge cards. And then finally, because you are very special in being here today, as you leave worship today, we have a special gift for you, and the ushers will give those to you as well, and they're not pledge cards. Um, so all of, you, all of you, we look forward that you would receive a special gift as you leave worship today. Um, we're going to sing the next song, Of the Father's Love Begotten, but please have the uh, green insert handy. We're going to be utilizing that for our Christmas Day confession and candle lighting. the 
Advent read, remember that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and to him there is no darkness and there is no sin. We rejoice in the good news this day that those who are found believing and trusting in Jesus Christ will receive mercy. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
missing the next song, with child is this. Uh, if you are a guest today or a visitor, uh, don't feel any obligation whatsoever to give a gift in the offering plate because we consider you to be a gift and we thank you for joining us in worship today. Please join me now in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of the season and for the joy of giving. We've seen in the unwrapping of gifts that we have received, O oh Lord, the joy of what these gifts mean and the joy that it brings us who give. In like manner, use these financial gifts this morning to bring joy to others and to provide us with a deeper joy knowing that we are participating in your holy work both here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing with child is this. Uh, 
I was able to watch Mary give birth on stage. I've not seen that before in a Christmas pageant. And I think it was W.C. Fields who once said, um, you know, I've never worked with animals and kids. He didn't know what he was talking about because um, that was a great, great week. Uh, Lim shared with me a, a video clip off of YouTube of another Christmas pageant. It's not ours. It could have been ours. This is not ours. And uh, it was so good that I felt we just have to show it to you today. So watch the video screen. Um, we had people come as visitors 
um, last week, and um, I told these people, when, if I was able to spot them in, in the sanctuary, I, I told them, I'm really sorry, today is not like regular church for us. Today is our Christmas pageant, and that's my way of saying, I have no idea what's going to happen today. So, you know, just kind of hold on and let's kind of see what happens. Why, why would I have to apologize, or why would I have to give that disclaimer? I, I know why. I'll answer that for you. It's because I went to seminary. And, and I was taught in seminary how to do worship. I mean, how to do it right. How to do it with reverence. How to do it with holiness. How to do it predictably and, and with order and with cleanliness and with, you know, a, a kind of sense of reverence. And so it's my way of saying, I just don't know if this is reverent today. It's a, it's a problem that I have. The reality is, if you really think about it, the very first Christmas pageant, the one, you know, that Jesus was born into, was anything but predictable. It was anything but clean and orderly and neat and, you know, all the things that we would have imagined. Chances are, if, if we had been wandering the streets in Bethlehem, that first Christmas pageant, we'd seen, you know, this pregnant woman and this man walking down the street, we would not have thought um, that this was anything special. We, we would not have thought that there's a holy thing that's taking place uh, around us. Here is Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph um, in the pageants. Uh, we, we throw a beard on Joseph, but in reality, they're always about the same age, right? Mary and Joseph. And Joseph and Mary, those are the prime parts. How many of you were ever Mary and Joseph in a Christmas pageant? They never asked me to be Joseph. And... Um, but the problem, of course, is that Mary and Joseph were quite different than our reality of that. Mary was very young, maybe 13, maybe 14 years old. So she's not a lot older than the girls that we have playing Mary. But Joseph was quite a bit older. Joseph would have been in his 20s. So I'm pretty sure if we'd seen Mary and Joseph walking down the streets of Visalia, we might think about calling Child Protective Services. And, and then we have Mary and Joseph out looking for a room at the inn. Doesn't seem to be a place for them. And, and we give this part, uh, it's a devilish part really, to some kid to be the innkeeper who has the responsibility of saying to Mary and Joseph, sorry, uh, we have no place for you in the inn. I'm convinced that most adults who no longer go to church today, but they used to, they were given the part at one point in their life to play the innkeeper of, of having Jesus being born out into the cold. But now you know the reality is there, there weren't hotels like we have them today. Um, and, and so there was no like holiday inns or Ramada inns or Hampton inns or not even the Marco Polo inn. What they had was just simply dwellings, homes. And some homes are larger than others. And uh, you see, the Jews had a really strong ethic with regard to hospitality. And so if you were traveling into a city and you didn't know anyone, um, it was quite permissible for you to be invited in by anybody. And the larger the house, the better. That would give you more room. And so for Mary and Joseph to be turned out into the cold it simply meant that there wasn't a square inch available. Had there had been, they would have been invited in. Not a square inch available on anyone's floor anywhere in Bethlehem. And then we put Mary and Joseph um, out in, well, we call it the manger. We generally kind of envision in our Christmas pageants. It's some open air kind of outdoor barn or stable setting. The, the reality is um, that the manger scene was probably in a cave, kind of a hewn out of a rock area. Or, or perhaps it was um, a dwelling, like a basement underneath one of these houses. Sometimes people would build their houses over their stable areas so that the heat from the animals would heat the house as well. And, and the manger scene that we create in our Christmas pageants, well, that... Um, that thing that holds the baby Jesus, it's generally like two by fours and plywood all nailed together with, you know, we put hay in the bottom to make it comfortable for the baby. But we know well enough that the, that the real manger was nothing more than a, a feeding trough that animals would come up to and, and slop their food out of. 
And, and then there were the shepherds. Now, I always thought, growing up, the shepherds were the coolest part to play. We, um, we put bathrobes on our shepherds, and we give them a stick, and we say, you have no speaking lines. You just follow the shepherd in front of you. My, um, my wife is from a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, down in Southern California, and they have German shepherds in their Christmas patterns. <laughs> The shepherds were, in reality, kind of a motley bunch of people. Now, I know that there are some who would make an argument the shepherds um, had something going for them. In reality, they didn't. The, the shepherds weren't bright enough to be a, a disciple of a rabbi. Um, they weren't skilled enough to take on, you know, an intricate job like being a carpenter. They didn't even know how to fish. And, and so, well, what's left? They, they would say, well, you go hang out with the sheep and take care of them. They were not the smartest people in the world, and, uh, and they smelled. Um, so that's kind of a good connection with many of our shepherds in their Christmas pageants, some of which do smell. And if you have shepherds, you have to have sheep, right? But in our Christmas pageants, we uh, actually throw in all sorts of animals, and donkeys, and cows, and uh, camels sometimes. I've even seen Christmas pageants that have had pigs in them. And, uh, and we generally give those roles to the, to the littlest of the kids, right? Because, you know, if they're going to wander off stage, well, then at least they're in character. But in reality, we, we don't know what kind of animals were in that first Christmas pageant. The Bible doesn't give us any explanation. Now, chances are there weren't any sheep there because the shepherds would not likely risk losing their sheep by bringing them into the city of Bethlehem. Um, and for goodness sakes, we know there weren't any pigs there. After all, these were good Jews. They would not have pigs anywhere near their homes. But whatever was there, we know that that first Christmas pageant, it smelled pretty badly. And then we have angels. The angels show up. And um, I don't know why we do this, but girls always play the parts of angels, which has baffled me ever since I was a little kid, because I read the Bible and I saw... The angels were generally male characters, you know, Michael and Gabriel, and, 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 the, and, the, and the angels were scary looking too, because whenever they would show up, they'd always say, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, but we always give the angel role to these really cute little girls. Now, how many of you would be scared by any one of those? <laughs> and then the wise men show up. Um, usually, uh, we give the role of the wise men uh, to the older kids, at, at least the taller kids. There's something about wise men that, in our minds, we figure they have to be kind of tall, and, and they're always guys. And um, to be truthful, this is kind of a hard part in the Christmas pageant to portray, not because there are speaking lines, there are not any speaking lines, but because, uh, as we follow the biblical story, that the wise men don't show up until... Many years after Jesus is born, they're not there to take a family picture with the shepherds and the angels and all of those people. They come a couple of years later. And we don't know how many wise men there were. Uh, we say three because they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but, but the Bible doesn't tell us how many. There might have been 33. And further, we, we don't really know if they're wise or not. They, they may have been the dumbest boards on the face of the earth, but <laughs> what we do know is that they were stargazers. They were simply out watching the stars and following the stars. And then, of course, um, the best pageants always have uh, King Herod, and always the best-looking person in the church plays the role of Herod. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> but um, putting Herod in, in this uh, pageant it, along with the wise men, we have to remember that uh, Herod doesn't react to the story of Jesus' birth until after his birth, by a couple of years. Now the problem, of course, is giving, giving a part of, of Herod within the story of the telling of the birth of Jesus is, well, it's like giving Hitler a speaking part in, in The Sound of Music. I mean, Herod was a despicable tyrant. He was an evil, maniacal Individual, He was a lunatic. So um, Christmas pageants uh, in this day or any other day are set with all of these characters participating in one way or another. We've done it for years and 
And as I said, I hope we do it for a long time to come, because I'm afraid that if we stop doing these Christmas pageants, we'll miss something. Right? Maybe what, what will happen is we'll be losing, we'll be losing a part of our faith. Why would I say that? Well, because I'm afraid that if we start to clean up this story, if we start to give the responsibility of telling the, the birth story of Jesus to adults, or worse than adults, to professional adults, it's going to come off as a slick story. It's going to be too clean, too orderly, too neat. I mean, people, they're not going to sing off key, will they? They're not going to forget their lines. They're not going to wander off stage. And that's kind of my point. It would just be too slick. You give this job to, to adults, and there's going to be, you know, real animals wandering through the sanctuary, and animatronics, and, uh, and, and choruses, and if we gave this job to Lim, you know, we would have like Placido Domingo, who's going to be one of the angels, and if we gave the job to David Lemon, there would be pyrotechnics going on all over the place, it would be a disaster. What I'm trying to say is that that first Christmas pageant is similar to all Christmas pageants that have gone on ever since. They're unpredictable. It, it, it's, it's a moment of incredible event that God is at work, not knowing exactly how this is going to unfold. A, a bit irreverent, a, a bit off-key, a, a bit problematic. That's what that first Christmas pageant was, and that's what every Christmas pageant ever since should be. One of our problems as 21st century Western thinking people, we've been highly influenced in our thinking by the Greco-Roman influence. The, the philosophers of thousands of years ago have really affected the way we think. One of the things that we have um, inherited from the Greco-Roman influence is something called dualism. Dualism basically puts things into two categories. There's a good category and a not so good category. And when it comes to religious faith in the dualistic way of looking at things, you know, there's, um, there's the spiritual world. That's really good. And then there's the material world. Not so good. There's the sacred. That's great. And then there's the secular. Not so great. The, the Greco-Roman way of thinking introduces us to God who is wholly other than us, kind of distant and out there and, and full of all of these powerful characteristics that we, we talk about, omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and all of those kinds of things. And, and this God starts looking more like, well, like Zeus from the Greco-Roman mythologies, sitting among his heavenly minions. But the Hebrew world, the, the world in which the Old Testament is written, and, and the world in which Jesus comes from as a different way of looking at life. For the Hebrew-minded person, there is no dualism. Everything is connected. You can't separate the, the, the sacred from the secular. You can't separate the, the holy from the profane. So for many people, especially those who are influenced by the Greco-Roman way of thinking, it is not easy to think about God, this Zeus-like character, coming down to earth, being born in, in a paltry situation of, of a feeding trough, being surrounded by dirty, smelly, unpredictable people. <clears throat> These Greco-Roman dualists are the ones who would come to worship on a Sunday last su like last Sunday, and say to themselves, I'm not really sure what happened today, but all I can tell you, it just didn't feel like church. But these people fail to see. So God is really there. God is truly present, not only in that first Christmas pageant, but in every Christmas pageant since acted out. God is in those children. God is in those kids that are singing off-key and picking their noses and pulling up their dresses. God is watching over this silly story and saying, this looks really familiar. I've seen this before. I've been a part of this very event before. And God is with you, too. God is no less involved 
in your wild and unpredictable life. No less involved in those moments of your life when everything seems so irreverent. Involved in those lives, times of your life when you feel as if you are singing way off key. God is with you. The one for whom that first Christmas pageant was one unpredictable, impossible thing happening right after another is the God who continues to walk with us in our Christmas pageants of everyday life. And with each and every person that you will see, experience life with today, tomorrow, and the rest of your life, God is with them as well. The Greco-Roman way of thinking, that dualism, has a tendency to tell us that there are people that God is with and then people that God is not with. There are those of God's favor and then those who are somehow not favorable to God. Don't believe those people. God is with us all, each and every one of us, and all that you will encounter. Reclaim your Jewish roots. God, Emmanuel, made a promise never to leave us, always to be with us, never to abandon, never to deny, none of us, anytime, anywhere, ever. God bless the kids who play those parts in the Christmas pageants. And God bless you as you play your part as well in the pageant of everyday life. May you find joy in carrying this Jesus within your life and then discovering Jesus present in others around you. Sing loud. Sing often. And if necessary, to get others' attention, sing off key. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. Share the peace of Christ with those who are near you. Father, we pray for those who are in need of your healing today. Uh, we thank you, God, great God, that, uh, that you do listen to the cries of, of those who are suffering. And so we lift up uh, Jan Ziegler and David Long and Linda Monroe, Shirley Arnold, Kate Montez and Ginger Miller, Emily Lang and Ed Zisco, Amy Zisco, Debbie Gullard and John Heinstone, Jerry Jacobson, Maria Panetta, Diana McCoy, Chris Helvis, and Andy Ballaroo. Grant these brothers and sisters and others that we have named silently to you as they await healing. We pray for those who grieve the loss of loved ones. We, we pray for the family of Alan Rayfield, who are grieving his loss. We pray for the family of Sharon Saadi, that you would bless them in the death of Sharon and that you would hold them through this time and, and bless them especially on Thursday as we gather to celebrate Sharon's life. Watch over Alvin Tiffany in summer. And Father, we lift up the Ziesler family to you and, and ask that you would carry them through the time of grief and, um, and the news of Robin's passing earlier this morning. 
Be with us, O Lord, that we might seek the lost and bind up the injured and strengthen the weak until you gather us and all your saints into the eternal feast with, with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We gather on the table of our Lord to celebrate his presence, being reminded of the night of his betrayal. He took bread, <coughs> gave many, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it for all the drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The meal is prepared. It is God who extends to you the invitation to go forward and receive. Uh, we practice what is called open communion here at Christ Lutheran. That simply means you don't need to be a member of any church. We invite all who believe in the presence of Christ in this meal to come forward and receive. And as we commune, we have two prayer stations, one forward in the sanctuary and one back in the sanctuary. The members of our prayer team will be there. Whatever prayer needs that you might have today, please feel free to go to the prayer stations. Come now. All things are ready.
to end with me in prayer. Lord God, send us now as we celebrate the joy of this day. Help us to hold fast to the gift of Jesus, to encounter him each and every day. And where we encounter despair, allow us to announce as the angels did, that the good news of peace that has come upon us because of Jesus' presence in the world is making all of the difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise and receive the benediction. And now may the gift of the Christ child fill you with all joy. May the presence of Jesus in your life provide you with a childlike wonder and expectation. And may you share the good news always for those who are open to this gift of God in everyday Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain.